The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Five years ago, it might have been hard for many of us really to grasp the social effects that disease can inflict on a community. I don't think it's hard for us to imagine that anymore. The ancient Israelites certainly knew very well what kind of a strain the scourge of incommunicable, of, sorry, communicable disease, communicable disease uh, could put on common life. You need only read these stories about lepers, like the one from um, Kings today, uh, to, under, to see that this was a very lively reality for them, this reality of leprosy. The leper was a person who was necessarily exiled to the remotest edges of society in Israel. They had a rough lot, to say the least. The law required them to wear torn clothes, to let the hair of their head hang loose, to live outside the camp where Israel dwelt during its desert sojourn. And whenever people came near them to stand far off, probably more than six feet, and cry out, unclean, unclean. It was a painful, shameful, and lonely existence for lepers in Israel. So the day of the lepers' cleansing was a very holy and joyful day. You can read about this in the book of Leviticus. It gives very precise instructions for what a leper is to do to kind of confirm and certify their cleansing. They would go to the priest for a whole series of tests and probings to make sure the leprosy is actually gone. And then in a culminating ritual of purification, the leper is sprinkled with the blood of a sacrificed bird. The job of the priest, with all of these testings and probings, was to restore the leper to the fullness of the life of the community, to certify that they were ready to return, and to pronounce healing over a life that had been ravaged by this disease. So when ten lepers come up to Jesus and he tells them, go and show yourselves to the priests, this is the background that we should have in mind, this Old Testament matrix, this Old Testament uh, presupposition that we find in the law in Leviticus. The ten lepers were doing in this story what the law required. They were standing at a distance to avoid contact and raising up their voices to warn people to beware. Doubtless, they had heard the reports that were spreading around the region about this teacher and healer, and so naturally they come to him, seeking healing. But now, instead of their usual cry of shame, unclean, unclean, their words are very different. And what they say instead is this simple prayer. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. The verse that you and I sang together a few moments ago in our psalm says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I think sometimes we often think of or at least we're inclined to think, or people who, uh, who um, have never heard that before might be inclined to think that what we're talking about there is a kind of fear of a tyrant, right? The, the, the fear that makes us kind of um, not really want to be around the one that we fear, right? The fear of the Lord. But what I want to suggest to you today is that this story about the ten lepers teaches us something really important about the nature of that fear, about the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. And what I want to suggest to you is that fear of God, fear of the Lord, in the proper sense, is a necessary complement to love for God. Fear of God is a necessary complement to love for God. And this fear finds its ultimate consummation in thanksgiving. That's what I want to try to uh, show you is being taught to us in this passage today. Fear of God is the necessary complement to love of God, and fear of God finds its ultimate consummation in thanksgiving. So let's see how we can see this in 
these in this story. So first of all, what do I mean by love for God? What does this story tell us about the nature of love for God? Well, notice the effect that Jesus had on these outcasts of society, even before their healing. Simply by the presence of Jesus in their land, by the witness of those who were spreading the word about him, there arose in these ten lepers a free and spontaneous longing, a longing for an encounter with this prophet and healer. They believed, before they ever saw him, that Jesus was the one who could bring them healing. And before he even arrived in their village, they were already there, standing and waiting, positioned far off, again, as the law required, but no longer with those words of distancing on their lips, unclean, unclean, or rather, Jesus, Master, have mercy. They knew that this was someone to whom they could go for help. They were not timid in their request. They were not shy about approaching a stranger. They boldly, confidently, and intrepidly called upon the Lord, and he heard them. In other words, they showed a longing for God, a longing for healing that was inspired by the name of Jesus, the name that charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease, that's music to the sinner's ears and life and health and peace, as our hymn so beautifully said. That name of Jesus. Do you remember the first time you heard the name of Jesus? Many of us probably don't remember the first time, just because it's, it's been with us since before, you know, we, we even uh, have memories. I think my, when I reach back into the recesses of my uh, my memories, my childhood memories, the first thing I think of when I, when I remember kind of encountering the name of Jesus for the first time is those drawings that we used to do in Sunday school, right, of Jesus on the, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, um, teaching his disciples, kind of um, gently guiding them, of the, the pictures of Jesus with the, the lamb on his shoulder, right, uh, bringing them back uh, to the fold, bringing them back home. I have these these images just imprinted on my imagination of this gentle shepherd, this gentle savior, this welcoming presence with whom I can confidently relate, right? To whom I can come, with whom I can have access to God and not be afraid. Access to God and be confident that God wants to hear my prayer. Come to God boldly through this Jesus, this gentle Jesus, this welcoming Jesus, who charms all of my life and who, and who invites me into that, that divine welcome. Now that's good news, right? That's, that's good news that the name of Jesus shows us this God, this welcoming God to whom we can come with all of our needs, boldly, confidently longing for him to heal us. Because we all, at some level, have leprosy in us. Most of us obviously haven't suffered from actual leprosy itself, though obviously that disease is still out there, but we've all had the experience of what it's like to be sick, whether that sickness is physical, spiritual, emotional, or moral. And we've all, I dare say, also had the experience of being left outside the camp. Some more than others, to be sure. But I defy you to find a person who hasn't felt at times like they don't belong, like others don't want them around, like they're somehow dirty or intrinsically undesirable. That's all of us at one time or another. Maybe that's what some of us are feeling right now. So what can we do in the midst of that sickness? How can we go on despite that isolation What does this passage tell us about that, about folding that into the love for God that these lepers display? Well, one way would be to do what the law prescribes, to identify yourself when you're having these feelings, these experiences of sickness or isolation, to identify yourself as unclean, right? To to, to take that word on your lips and to claim yourself as such, and to repeat it to yourself so much that it becomes the dominant lens 
through which you see yourself. Now, there is a necessary place in the Christian life for recognizing all the ways that each of us are, in a spiritual and moral sense, unclean, lacking the full radiance of immaculate human nature for which God created us. But if our recognition of our unworthiness becomes a subtle way of still just thinking about ourselves all the time, then that's a problem. In other words, if we get so busy worrying about how unworthy we are, then our uncleanness becomes the only thing we think about. We convince ourselves that this is the last and final word on us. That there's not really any hope that I'll ever be able to shake free from those bad habits and petty vices that seem to infect my daily life. Or that the sins I've committed are far too grave to have any hope of finding a merciful welcome from anyone, much less from the Holy One of Israel. There's a word in the Christian theological tradition for this kind of attitude, and it's called despair. Despair in the proper sense, which is the belief that my life is unsalvageable, even by God. It's quite the opposite of a confident longing for God like what these lepers show. They believed, these lepers, because of the word they had heard about Jesus, because of that name that had begun to soak into their souls, they believed that he was able to save them. And with the boldness of lovers, unashamed to throw themselves at the mercy of his grace, they cried out for help. And that's what we can do too. Jesus shows us, in all that he did, in all that he said, Jesus shows us that God is the kind of master and that he is the kind of Lord who wants us to come to him. Come to him in our illness. Come to him like a child who confidently rushes into his mother's arms when he's hurt, knowing that there he will find solace and comfort. And if you don't know how to pray to God that way, by the way, with this kind of filial boldness, then I heartily commend to you the regular practice of praying the Psalms. There you will learn in a million different ways, in all of the different emotions of your soul, how to cry out to God and say, with confident longing, with confident boldness, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. So that's the first thing we learn, is about this confident boldness that these lepers have, and how we can have that too, trusting in God's desire to save us. But there's a second thing we've learned from these lepers' encounter with Jesus, and that's this. Having towards God the proper kind of fear actually enhances our love for him, enhances our capacity to come to him with this bold longing. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus sends all of these lepers to the priests, affirming, as he so often does, the continuity between his ministry and the life and uh, religious practice of Israel that came before him. He came not to abolish these things, but to fulfill them, as he says elsewhere. And so the lepers go off, and on the way they're healed. But here's where the nine let us down. They had all rightly called out to Jesus, boldly longing for him, trusting confidently in his power to help. But now that they're healed, they seem to have forgotten where they came from. Now, we don't know whether these nine were Jews. The text doesn't tell us explicitly. If we can infer it, though, that they were Jews, then there might be something here similar to what John the Baptist warned about with those people from Judea who came to him at the Jordan. He said, basically, don't think that having Abraham as your father means you have some kind of unconditional claim on God's favor. So, in other words, don't think, oh, nine lepers, that this healing you just received was owed to you because of your identity, your background, your tribe, or anything else with which you might differentiate yourself from other people. 
we do this sometimes too, right? We think that a certain kind of life is really what we deserve based on our family background or our education or how hard we've worked or something like that. But what the one leper whom Jesus raises up as our model here, the one who is doubly outcast as a Samaritan and a leper, what he teaches us is a different kind of attitude. He teaches us a kind of reverent awe at the sheer gratuity of God's goodness, of God's generosity. He shows us, unlike the nine, so the nine show us that a loving boldness in asking for God's help, if it's not balanced by something else, if this bold confidence is not balanced by something else, it can become what we call presumption. But in the case of the leper, he properly balances it with humility, a genuine humility. But what is that humility that he shows us? He comes back to Jesus, ignoring all the social distancing requirements, getting right up next to him, falling down on his face at his feet, and he gives him thanks. He gives him thanks. He makes Eucharist, is what the Greek actually says. The word Eucharist just means thanksgiving, and that's what he does at the feet of Jesus here. He shows us that um, the bold confidence that he had had before uh, is balanced out by this, by this reverent awe he has as a creature before his creator, falling down before him, saying, thank you. I do not deserve what you've done for me, and I am so grateful. I am in awful, awful, in the proper sense, wonder at these extraordinary gifts that you have given to me. So his love, his bold filial confidence is matched by a reverent awe for his Lord. Reverent gratitude is the necessary balance for filial boldness, just as filial boldness is the antidote for despair. So what we learn from this story are two essential sides to our relationship with God, two complementary dispositions, each of which support and sustain the other. Boldness and reverence, longing and fear, a confident childlike trust that God will rush to help us at our smallest need on the one hand, and on the other hand, a humble, awestruck gratitude at the wonder that the creator of the universe would be mindful of such a small, fragile creature as myself. Without a bold, confident desire for God, our reverence for him might become sheer terror at his majesty, as though he were a stern and powerful king that we would really be best to avoid as much as possible. But without a chaste and reverential fear of his holiness, on the other hand, then our filial confidence in God might become a casual over-familiarity, a sense that God is a cute and kindly grandfather who is ultimately a little boring. <laughs> All the lepers overcome the first temptation, but only the Samaritan overcomes the second. He ennobles a confident desire for his Savior with a marveling gratitude at the majesty of his maker. Fear of God, love of God. They go together. Fear of God makes us love God more. That's the extraordinary thing, right? Fear of God keeps love of God from becoming a complacency, and love of God keeps fear of God from becoming a kind of hatred of a tyrant. They go together because God is a majestic God, and his majesty is shown above all in his mercy. And that's what we celebrate here at this Eucharistic table where we fall down on our faces at the feet of our Lord, giving him thanks and praise, understanding that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and that in this Eucharist, wisdom is given to us, into our mouths, into our lives, to seal us with God's everlasting
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.